All right, we're in Matthew chapter 11 this morning. <clears throat> we started the uh, first couple of uh, paragraphs uh, last week. And uh, there's a little incident here that has stuck in my mind all week long. And that is John the Baptist in prison wondering if Jesus was really the Messiah or not. And that little incident is, is I don't know, odd or, or so interesting. We had a few comments on it as we were closing last week that uh, I apologize for not connecting everything last week, but it took, took a while, but a few thoughts that I'd just like to throw out here this morning as we start again. You know, John the Baptist was the forerunner of, of Jesus. They were kin. And John was this spokesman. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's, it's near. It's close. God is breaking into the world in a new way. And see, there's one coming after me that's going to be the man. He's increasing it, and I'm not even worthy to tie his shoes. And this was the man that also baptized Jesus. This was the man that said, I saw the dove from heaven come and alight on Jesus, and I heard God say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm very pleased. And this is the guy now, John the Baptist, who's in prison. And he has doubts. And he sent messengers to Jesus to say, are you really the Messiah? Or should we look for somebody else? And that, that, that bothers me. That shocks me. And so I th thought about several things through the week. Number one, <clears throat> it says something about the inspiration of Scripture. If I were writing a history of my family through, back through the ages, I would most assuredly leave out all the stories of the horse thieves and the drunkards and the people that uh, did bad things and all that. I would, I would clean it up especially if I was writing a fairy tale, I would clean it up so that everything is perfect. But when we read Scripture, we see people, good and bad, as they really lived. Our writers included the story of the great apostle Peter denying Jesus, not denying he even knew Jesus the night of the betrayal. And here we have a story of John the Baptist. And we want to say, why was that story included in Scripture? God wants us to see that these were real people. And they struggled with faith just like we do. And it's okay. It's okay. It says something about the inspiration of Scripture. Number two, and as John mentioned right at the close last week, John's question to Jesus was, are you really the Messiah? But underlying that is the question, <clears throat> where are you, God? <clears throat> Why don't you get me out of here? Uh, why don't you solve my problems? If you're Messiah, why don't you? And see, John was kept in, 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 in prison. He was not let out. Eventually, John the Baptist was beheaded before Jesus was crucified and, and glorified. And we think, that's so unfair. God, here was, here was the forerunner. Here was John the Baptist's 
preaching about the kingdom of heaven is coming. The kingdom of heaven, heaven is at hand. And yet he ended up in prison and executed before the kingdom came. Oh, God, that's, that's not fair, is it? So when we say in our agony, God, where are you? Why don't you get me out of here? Why don't you take care of my problems? All we can know is that God's plans are always good and right and perfect. He calls us to be faithful. He calls us to be trusting. And He calls us to worship Him as sovereign God because we're not the first person to have cried to God and God not answered the prayer the way we wanted it answered. So let's remember that. Now, in a way, item number three, John doubted, didn't he? He had some doubts. He had a lot of time on his hand in prison, on his hands in prison. Yes, we know that. And we know that Satan can get in there and, and twist it to make us accuse God and wonder about God and all that. Just like the great King David did in the Psalms, as we said. David talked pretty rough to God at times about where are you. But John doubted. <clears throat> he says, Jesus, are you the one or not? Of course, Jesus replied, yes, I am in a certain way. He said, just notice what I've done. I've healed the sick, raised the dead, proclaimed victory to the captives and all that. Which is a big yes, I am the Messiah. Don't worry, John, he would say. So when we, when we doubt, when we doubt, um, uh, I always thought, oh my, that's one of the most offensive, offensive things I can ever do for God, do to God. I, I, I could just never even think about questioning God or doubting God. But as I've lived, I realize that growing in faith, growing in trust, entails, in a way, an element of doubt. By that I mean all of us from time to time, ask the question, why, Lord, don't we? When we see death and we think, wasn't there a better way for the cycle of life and God's wisdom to occur than, than for us to have to deal with death? And we sort of sometimes say, why, Lord? But you know, that's a doubt. That's a question. And you know what? That's okay because that opens the door for growth. When we come through it and we understand that God is sovereign and He'll walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death, through the door of eternal life, and we know that we're strengthened, that opportunity to grow is there when we ask that question. And in fact, I dare say, if we didn't ask the question, why, Lord, we would be spiritually dead. We would be spiritually insensitive. If we have a heart that every once in a while has to say, Lord, I don't understand, that's okay. God has broad shoulders. He can handle it. He can take it. He can take our struggles and He can transform them, lift us up. So whenever we go through doubt and growth and victory in the end, let us view that as a time of training and, and support and teaching by God. Number four. Uh, we've talked a little bit about sometimes we go through temptation, and yet other times we would maybe go through the same event, but it's maybe a time of 
testing by God to see how true we are to Him. Here's an incident that happens in life, maybe. And for Satan, it's temptation to us. He says, uh, I'm going to solicit you to sin. I'm going to open the door to sin. See, here it is, people, me, Neil. <clears throat> open the door. I've got it open for you for sin. Walk right on through. I'm inviting you. That's what Satan does. On the other hand, God has taken this same situation and says, I'm looking into your heart to see if you're true to me. How, how faithful are you? How strong are you? And so I'm testing you. Not, test, not tempting us, but testing us to see how strong we are. And if we come through that on the other side, we're stronger. And God's victory has been won. The purpose has been given and fulfilled that we are now stronger than what we are. You know, when John was in prison, wondering, where, where are you, God? Why don't you solve my problems? Oh, Satan could have had a heyday. Yes, that's right, John. You missed it. You're mistaken. Jesus is not the man. John, you're, you're, you're on the wrong track. But instead, that was short-circuited to the power of God to say, no, Jesus is the Messiah. And so, let us also view our troubles, not from Satan, but as, as a good thing as we suffer. God brings us through in strength. All right, four little ideas uh, to, to think about. Let me pause here. Any, any thought or comment here on that? Yes, sir, Dr. May. You know, in those life and death situations, that I think Paul summed it up in that little sentence, the living is Christ to die is gain. Yes. Yes. And you know, when you doubt, the doubting I don't think is what's bad by person. It's where you turn for the answer. And John turned to Jesus for the answer to that question. Because yes. Jesus is the only one that had the answer. Yes. Yes. But you know, that's, that's so hard <clears throat> when we're suffering. It's so hard, yes. Yes, sir, John. Several times in the scriptures, it will refer to the mystery of righteousness. Okay. And it's also going to refer to the mystery of sin. Mm -hmm. And Paul's conclusion is you're not going to understand the mind of God. You can't do it. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his paths. His paths are beyond tracing out. Or who can understand the mind of God? Who's ever been God's counselor? Who's ever given to God that God should repay him? For through him and by him and for him are all things. And we just conclude, and to him be glory forever. Yes. I can't understand yes. it. And so that theologian who has spent 60 years studying the scriptures, if he has any humility at all, he will say, I don't understand yes. it all. Yes. But I'm, my faith is in God. Yes. It's not my understanding, not my humility, not my anything. I need to focus on Jesus Christ. Yes. That's it. Yes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Yeah. That's all we can say. Thank you. Yes. Anything else? <clears throat> Alright. We'll, we need to move on. Uh, <clears throat> Jesus answer John's question basically to say yes I, I am the Messiah and then as John's disciples begin to believe Jesus says some statements about John so let's uh, let's read this again we'll read verses 7 through 15 7 through 15 <clears throat> and as John's disciples were leaving Jesus 
began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it's written. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you that among those born of women there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet, whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence and violent people have been raiding it for all the prophets in the law prophesied until John and if you're willing to accept it he is the Elijah who was to come whoever has ears let them hear Jesus talks to the crowd they all knew about John the Baptist. Uh, John the Baptist was this guy that was considered a little strange, a little odd, out in the wilderness, preaching about repentance, preaching about turning to God, that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He dressed a little odd and ate a little odd, but Jesus says, did you go out to the wilderness to see a, a big reed piece of cane that just blows whichever way the wind blows and of course the answer is not given but it's no you remember John the Baptist had a backbone just a little bit when he was baptizing some of the good Good self-righteous Pharisees came out to be baptized. And he called them a brood of vipers. You brood of vipers, why are you coming for me to me to be baptized? You need to show deeds worthy of repentance. And don't talk to me about, oh, we're okay because we have the lineage, the pedigree, the family history of Abraham as our father. Don't talk to me that you're okay with God simply because of your birth. Because if God needed more sons of Abraham, he could raise them up out of these stones. He had a backbone. And that's what got him beheaded later on because he stood for what was right. So when Jesus says, did y'all just go up to the wilderness to see John as, 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 as one who just uh, blowing in the wind? Of course, the answer is no. All right, then you did you go out there to see some great man uh, dressed in fine clothes? No, of course not. Those kind of people are pampered in the king's palaces. All right, then what did you go out to see, he says? A prophet? Yes, he's, Jesus would say, and yet even more than a prophet. He was the supreme prophet, the spokesman for God, in the shoes of the great man Elijah of the Old Testament and Jesus says uh, this is about whom it's written that he Jesus uh, or John would be this forerunner for for him and then he says among those born of women which means us humans us mortals us common folks there has not been anyone greater than John the Baptist. And that was the highest compliment Jesus could have given him. The finest man that has lived up until now. Yet, he says, whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. 
Well, what do you mean, Jesus? You see, the kingdom of heaven is coming. And there's going to be a point when the kingdom starts. And when God's kingdom starts, we are born anew, born again into the kingdom. And that's the new life. That's the new birth. John was the prophet right up to the edge. John, as we said, never got to see this new kingdom that he preached about so much. He was martyred. He was killed for the kingdom. That is the coming of the church. God's kingdom occurred. And Jesus says, there hasn't been a man born yet greater than John. And yet, let's remember, for those who are in the kingdom of God in the near future, they will have blessings and spiritual gifts and things and wonderfulness relationship with God that he was not able to access. And that astounds us. John, born of woman, spokesman, wonderful man, yet the blessings in Christ, the kingdom of God, are so much superior that they're incomparable, Jesus would say. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Let me pause there. I, that's, that's just such a good idea. You know, we, we grow up in the church, and that's good, it's proper, absolutely. But sometimes we fail to see the wonderfulness of the blessings of being in the kingdom of heaven. Citizens of the kingdom. All right, verse 12, I do not know. Go ahead. One more interruption. Yes. Right here. He's been bragging on John the Baptist and other things. But then he says, if you're willing to accept it. Yes. Yes. That's in verse 14. Yes. If you're willing to accept it. Now that replies to every scripture that's written down in the Bible. Mm -hmm. If you're willing to accept it, mm -hmm. that makes a difference to me. Wondering about it yes. or arguing about it or having a debate on it. Yes. If God said it, mm -hmm. that's it. Yes. If you're willing to accept this. Yes. And Jim and I were talking this morning. Our society is not going to accept what God said. They're going to accept what they want. Yes. And so we're now living under a new era in the history of the world and the history of the church where evil is good and good is evil. <clears throat> That's hard to accept. In the last few weeks, I have I have seen you know the reaction of America about the ruling that federal law does not give the right to chill to kill unborn children, call it abortion. To all the states and we've seen people and of course the news is very slanted it's, I don't watch it can't take it because I don't want to hear that stuff but as John says they don't accept the word of the Lord and they're proud of it I don't want to know how many people think it's okay that life in the womb is just a little medical problem. I don't want to know the percentage of people that think that now. I would be crushed. And these same people, I don't want to know how many people believe <clears throat> that being unfaithful to your spouse is okay as long as you did get caught. Don't get caught or promiscuity before marriage is just okay. 
I don't want to know want to know that percentage. It would be crushing. That's the word of the Lord. That's the standards of morality that we grew up with. And we the yes, if you're willing to accept it. And they are. And Janelle and I talk about this almost every night. What what about our kids? What about our grandkids? What about the church? You know, there's just just a few that and, and, and we're, we're made fun of. We're, 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 we're Neanderthals to think such things. It's, it wears us down. It wears me down. And I just... Maybe it should. I don't know. But it, but it bothers me. I wonder, is it okay to ask uh, who are the least important? But even the least important person in the kingdom is greater than John. Are we the least important? I just wonder, who is that? I, I don't know. Probably sort of a figure of speech. Whoever thinks he or she is the most insignificant person in the church has the blessings more so than John was able to receive. Okay. Okay. A shepherd. Sh a shepherd? Okay. You know, and that was probably one of the lowest... Uh, the rung of the ladder. Okay. Mm -hmm. In other words, you don't have to be a king to be in the kingdom of heaven. Right. Or the mayor or the governor. Yes. Yes. All right. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> We look at John the Baptist, and again, like we said, it seems so unfair that he didn't get to see the results of his work. But that's, that's God's plan. Now, I don't understand verse 12 because verse 12 talks about from the days of John the Baptist and now there's been violence in the kingdom and some violent people have, have sort of tried to Maybe take it over or whatever, and I, I don't know. No one seems to know. I'm not going to spend much time on it. it. It could be that Jesus is just saying that there are some hotheads out there that they were called zealots from our word, you know, zeal, being really motivated. There were some groups out there that were wanting to take Jesus and put him on the white horse and run and start a revolution. There were some people that wanted to start the revolution right now. Jesus, you're going to get the armies together and, and we're going to have a revolt. He could be talking about that. Or he could be talking a little bit lower key violence, just like we read in chapter 10. Families are split based on the acceptance of Jesus as Messiah if you are willing to accept it mom believes dad doesn't son believes daughter doesn't vice versa whatever brother will betray brother to death Jesus predicts and a father his child and children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death and all that stuff what is he talking about as we said in the last chapter when the Jewish authorities were trying to stamp out this, this upstart belief that Jesus was the Messiah, they went house to house knocking the door. Do you know anybody who believes and follows this guy, Jesus? Tell us at the point of the sword. Tell us who they are. Or, or if you don't, we'll get you. And people will rat it out, as we would say. Could be talking about that. I don't know. But but Jesus is saying there's there's been... been things upsetting even violent here and I'll just leave it there uh, about that and John I don't know if you have any better thoughts than that no okay now he ends all this in verse 15 that uh, sums, sums, sums up what he wants us to do he says now if you've got ears to hear let them hear <clears throat> meaning in our 
phraseology in our way of speaking is, listen up. <clears throat> Did you hear me? Uh, do you understand me? Uh, pay attention. Uh, are you listening? And sometimes with our kiddos, we remember, you know, did you hear what I said? Well, yeah, I've got ears to hear the words, but really what we're asking is, do you understand and uh, want to follow what I just told you? And I think Jesus is ending up this little thought about John is the Elijah, if you are willing to accept him. Now, whoever has ears, pay attention. That's important. Figure it out. Understand it. Listen up. And that's, that's sort of his, his conclusion. And if you remember, Jesus uses this little phrase throughout his, his teaching. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Pay attention. Listen. This is important. This will be on the test, as our, as our teachers used to say. This will be on the test. Listen up. Pay attention. And that's how he closes that. All right. So what kind of statement is that? Of course everyone has ears. Of course everyone could hear. What kind of, is that a rhetorical uh, statement? Or? Yeah, that's a figure of speech. You, okay. you know, somebody has a level head. That's our figure of speech for somebody that's got common sense, but it's a weird phrase because nobody's head is absolutely level, but that's sort of what it means. So it's a, it's a figure of speech, I would say. Of course we have all ears. Everybody has ears, so just use them. Jesus would say. Okay. Anything else? All right, our next few verses, 16 through uh, 19. Jesus is talking about the followers of himself and followers of, of John. And yet, he bemoans that so few have followed he would say so few have accepted it and he compares it to uh, a bunch of children playing follow the leader so to speak and this is this is what he says verse 16 now he says to what can I compare this generation <clears throat> They're like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to the others. We played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, but you did not mourn. He says, then John, for John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, ooh, he has a demon. The son of man, meaning himself, Jesus, came eating and drinking. And they say, Ugh, he's a glutton and a drunkard. And he has a he has a he is a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her Good. deeds. Okay. Now we all remember uh, as kiddos playing the little game follow the leader you know it'd be a string of us and the leader gets gets the lead and do as I do so if we put our hands over our head we do this everybody does that but out this way the kids do this follow the leader we know that Jesus is saying I don't know what to compare this generation to it's like a bunch of kids playing follow the leader and nobody follows. And he has a little quotation here. It's like they were playing a happy time, maybe a, a wedding, but, but, but nobody participated. Well, let's, 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 let's play a dirge. Let's have a funeral. Let's be sad. Nobody participated. And he says, John, uh, Jesus says, you know, John, the Baptist and myself were two different people, uh, personality wise, all that. He says, John came, 
he was considered a little odd. <clears throat> he lived out in the wilderness. People thought he was a little strange. He was sort of isolated. And he was very, very down to earth. He didn't uh, go to big events. And people said, oh, he has a demon. <clears throat> And then Jesus says, but I came along and I went to weddings, went to funerals, eating and drinking, so to speak. And I was accused of being a glutton and a drunkard. And who? A friend of tax collectors and sinners even. And as we would say, you can't win for losing. Which way do you want it? Do you want it both ways? Fine. But... Both of us tried to say the kingdom of heaven is coming. I was accused of this. John was accused of that. Written off because you know what? If we do not want to accept something, as we just read, I can find every reason in the world not to accept it. Right? I can do that. And that's what I think Jesus is saying. We were accused of being either odd or friend of tax collectors and sinners, whatever. But the end result is wisdom is proved right in, in the end by what happens. In other words, John was successful. He did what was called for him to do, and he did it. And I am on my mission to do what God calls me to do, and I will be successful. And so look at the result in the end of what happens. Uh, both, have, both of us have the functions we have and both of us have God's, God's plan in mind. And our point, each of us are different, we know that. Each of us have different blessings of God, gifts. Each of us approach life differently. And I think Jesus would say, that's good. God blesses all of us as we follow Him. Being as straight as John was, being as open as Jesus was, whatever, we're with God.